Welcome to Canada and thank you so much for joining us today, Minister Parker. Uh, it's my absolute pleasure. Hey, you've been sitting down with other countries talking about how to reform the World Trade Organization. It's something Donald Trump says he has no use for. What did you discuss at this meeting about how countries like Canada and New Zealand can navigate and try to bring meaningful change to the WTO? You know, 13 countries in the room that Canada brought together today represent uh, GDP twice that of the United States. Uh, we, we were there trying to find solutions to address the legitimate concerns of the USA, things like problems in the appellate body, the fact that the WTO doesn't seem to be able to update its rules to meet current challenges. Uh, and there was an acknowledgement in the room that if we can't achieve that as an international community, then the WTO will wither. Is it hard to figure out what changes to make, though, if you don't have the two biggest players there, and that's China and the United States? Well, you know, you, 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 actually sometimes these negotiations can be bigger than Ben-Hur. Uh, there are other negotiations, for example, there's one going at the moment that involves the EU, Japan and USA in, in respect of what are called notifications, transparency around subsidies by different countries. Uh, so there's more than one thing going on at the same time, uh, but this is a really worthy effort on the part of Canada to bring together like-minded countries to see if we can make a difference. How important is it to be able to maintain an institution like the WTO in this uncertain international environment? The smaller the country, the more important it is. But even larger countries like G20 countries like Canada, uh, it's obvious from their comments that they believe in the system as well. They think that the rule of law is important, including in trade, and that's effectively what the WTO gives us. It's effectively the rule of law relating to trade that can be enforced internationally. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about China all around the world with Donald Trump's potential trade war, which it appears he's implementing. Certainly here in Canada, we've been talking about it because we just signed the USMCA deal that has restrictions potentially on Canada's ability to sign a trade deal with China. I bring this up because in New Zealand, I was fascinated to learn that China is your biggest trading partner and that you've had 10 years this month of free trade with China. How has that worked out for you? Very well. Uh, we've got a trade uh, balance with uh, China that's a slight surplus for New Zealand. It is our largest uh, trading partner. It, 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 it sort of flips between China and, and Australia being our largest uh, trading partner, but they're both very, very important. Uh, to put it in, in context, it's about twice as much as our trade uh, with the United States. Um, so, you know, we, we've got a good trading relationship with the United States, uh, with Europe, uh, with Australia and China as well. One of the concerns that's been raised around China is that they pour cheap goods into the market, that it can depress wages, it can displace jobs. Have you had that experience with your free trade with China? Uh, not really, no. Uh, I think the technological disruption that's been caused by the digitalization and automation of many jobs would have been of more effect uh, than that. There have been uh, outsourcing of jobs to lower labor cost uh, countries around the world, including China. You know, we don't really have a um, a textile industry in New Zealand now, but I think that would have happened irrespective of whether you had a free trade agreement with, uh, with China. And we're careful in our conversations with New Zealanders to say, look, you, know, you can't blame other countries for the technology revolution that's sweeping the world either. Just got to make sure that the government supports are in there for people to retrain, for example, if they lose their job and to push against some of the adverse effects of globalisation like multinational tax avoidance and the like. What would your advice be to the Canadian government if they're considering a free trade deal with China? Oh, well, I, I would say that's a, that's a matter for them. Uh, but if they want uh, to look for what you would have as to good rules in an agreement that protect both sides of that transaction, they could look at the terms of the New Zealand agreement and indeed the, uh, the terms that are in the uh, CPTPP agreement that China's in the, uh, Canada's in the middle of signing up to and which we've all also ratified because they've got very good provisions in there too. We actually uh, just ratified that. So yeah. uh, both of our countries have done that now. That's right. One of the things that that agreement brought up, and so did USMCA, is the dairy industry. Mm. New Zealand used to have a system that was somewhat similar to Canada mm. in terms of supply management, quotas. You got rid of that system. We did. Uh, this is a sacred cow, so to speak, in Canada. What has the experience been for New Zealanders dealing with the dairy industry without yeah. those kinds of supports? Uh, our industry has become um, more efficient and larger. So uh, rather than being adverse to their interests, it's, it's turned out the opposite way. There were fears, of course, at the time, um, but it's worked out very well. So why do you think it is that some countries like Canada are, are so protectionist with it? They're so afraid to open that up. Uh, well, 
you, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not here to uh, opine as to why Canada X as it does in respect of its, uh, its industries. Uh, these are obviously sensitivities for the Canadian government and you probably should ask them. How does New Zealand deal with Donald Trump? Uh, respectfully. Uh, we, we, we have respectful relationships uh, with, uh, with every country in the world. You know, we're, we're a minnow in the world. Uh, uh, we haven't got the power to push anyone around. I've just been to Washington. Uh, we were treated very politely uh, and uh, uh, we wanted to learn more about some of the concerns that the United States has, for example, about how the WTO appellate body works. And we actually share their concerns. We agree that those... And what, what are some of those concerns? Uh, well, for example, we were joint uh, plaintiff with the United States in a case against another company in, country in respect of illegal practices relating to beef. Uh, the appellate body took um, nine months uh, when it should have taken three months to deliver a decision. And their, their, their eventual decision, which was in our favour, was six months late. And you never get a remedy for that six months that you've lost. Well, the rules say it's meant to be done within 90 days. So we're with the US, which says that the appellate body should stick, stick to it and uh, apply the rules. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we came here because we want to work with other like-minded countries like uh, Canada and the other countries in the room to try and bring forward practical solutions quickly to solve these problems that have been complained about long before the Trump administration but have yet to be fixed within the WTO. The last question I want to ask you is immigration, which I know is not really your file, but it's something that Canada's dealing with. We've had thousands of people coming across the U.S. border, claiming asylum in Canada. You're right next to Australia, which has had some very strict immigration policies. You've talked to them about possibly taking uh, some of the people who are on the Pacific Islands, who are refugees. How do you think, in, in this modern world where it seems like borders are disappearing, countries can deal with the challenges of people becoming more and more mobile and hoping to move somewhere where they can have a better life, but also the challenges that come with that? Well, you're right, I'm not the immigration spokesperson. Suffice it to say, these are vexed issues for the world and um, uh, they're very, very difficult issues that if you get wrong, uh, uh, cause um, uh, uh, unusual outcomes within countries as has been seen in parts of Europe. So uh, they're issues that we take seriously. Um, uh, we, we don't have to grapple with some of the issues that other countries have to because it's a lot of sea between us and anywhere. Um, uh, in respect of immigration policy more broadly, we're quite an open country. Uh, we're similar to Canada in that regard. We have high rates of immigration uh, and uh, we've found that it has helped aid in the prosperity of our country. But it's not without controversy in our own country as well, particularly in respect of um, uh, uh, immigration that uh, impacts upon the bottom end of the labour market. One last question. I'm very curious to know this because we've talked about populism rising in many countries around the world. Have you seen populism at all becoming a factor in New Zealand? Um, well, not in the same way that it's uh, bedeviling a lot of other countries. We're worried uh, about maintaining our liberal, open democracy and the public institutions that we rely upon and the level of taxation that's required to support them. So we try to have a conversation about the underlying issues that give rise to insecurity uh, in the middle classes, which is perhaps what's driving popularity. I would say one other thing, and I think that is, and this is a personal view that I've expressed with to a lot of other ministers around the world, we've got to get under control the abuses of social media, which is not just uh, fake news or uh, the um, inappropriate use of social media to try, uh, try and influence election outcomes. It's actually the pushing out of extreme opinion and uh, bile that um, undermines public confidence in democratic institutions. And I think if I had one issue that I could fix in New Zealand with that I think we share with the rest of the world is the extremes that uh, social media currently drive but take no responsibility for. Very interesting. Minister Parker, thank you so much. Thank you.